Uh, as Becky said, I'm Ken Ottenbacker uh, from the UTMB School of Health Professions, and I'm director of the Division of Rehabilitation Sciences. And uh, we're a co-sponsor of the lecture today, as, as Becky noted. And we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Craig Thornton from Mathematica Policy Research who will present on practical evaluation, effective collaborations between evaluators and providers. Dr. Thornton is a Senior Vice President for Mathematica Policy Research in Washington, D.C. He directs the Health Division and coordinates strategic planning as a Chief St Strategy Officer for Mathematica. During more than 35 years at Mathematica, Dr. Thornton's research has focused on evaluating health and disability programs, including Medicaid managed care, supported employment, housing assistance, home health care, and employment and training initiatives. He has helped to design a large number of evaluations to measure program effects, as well as to document and understand program operations. Dr. Thornton has extensive experience designing and implementing large multi-site demonstration evaluations and conducting process, impact, and benefit cost analyses. Dr. Thornton holds a PhD in economics from the Johns Hopkins University and has published widely in peer-reviewed research literature in health services, health policy management, and cost comparisons. In addition, he has served on many expert panels as well as the Board of Directors for Mathematica, the Center for Studying Health System Change, and Academy Health. We are honored to have Dr. Thornton join us today to share his perspectives, role of collaboration and evaluation in the current healthcare environment. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thornton to UTMB. So thanks very much, Dr. Attenbacher. Thanks for inviting me here, and thanks for everybody coming and spending your lunchtime uh, hearing uh, these remarks. Um, I, you know, direct a group of people who, like you, uh, spend a lot of time looking at health policy and disability policy. And these are really exciting times to be involved in these two fields. In the healthcare side, virtually everything is changing, right? How we finance care, how care is organized and delivered, how we even describe it, how we measure what's going on. Uh, virtually everything is changing. On the disability policy side, things go a lot more slowly, uh, but the impending exhaustion of the Disability Insurance Trust Fund in 2016 uh, means that even there, we're going to start seeing action and people think, well, how do we support uh, people with disabilities, particularly those that have the most severe limitations in their ability to support themselves. But of course, it's not just uh, research, uh, or not, not just the, the, the services, the providers world is changing. The world for researchers is changing also. We're going to be asking a lot more, being asked a lot more diverse questions, uh, and we're going to need to adopt and adapt new methods and new approaches, and particularly, I think, partnering uh, between evaluators and practitioners, which is the theme of today's talk. Uh, you know, there's so much going on, there's a, kind of the expression that got some currency a while back that a, a good crisis is a bad thing to waste. And uh, it's a little cynical, but I, I think it does come to something that's important for all of us to keep in mind, that there is so much going on, so much change. And when there's change, you get comparisons. And when you've got comparisons, you have research opportunities. And this is a time when we really need to be stepping up, working between, you know, practitioners and researchers. Uh, to really kind of be figuring out what's going on, how we guide what's happening right now and how we set a foundation for getting better as you get into the future. Because uh, I think the issues that we're trying to solve, the people whose lives we're trying to make better, is just too important for us to be doing anything less than our best. So there are two, um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'll use this one. Ah, okay. There are two kind of broad approaches to policy development. Uh, the one that Mathematica and is mostly involved in is kind of having independent program evaluators. Uh, and the, the gold standard, what's called the gold standard of double-blind random assignment, really kind of encapsulates this. You know, double-blind random assignment. We don't even want to know, you know, who's in the treatment program, who's in the control program. You know, they don't, you want them to know us. This is really totally independent. Uh, and this kind of work tends to uh, proceed through testing a whole variety of hypotheses. A big cycle, you test something, did it work or not, then you refine it, you test another one. At a fairly large scale, it can take a long time. Um, there's another tradition, uh, which I would call the quality improvement effort. This effort tends to, uh, you know, uh, evolve more organically in organizations. It's all about more short-term decision-making, improving processes. Um, 
and it can be very effective. Uh, at the same time, it may not produce the same kind of evidence. It does not produce the same kind of evidence you get from independent evaluation. Uh, and it's this difference I want to come back to. And uh, as you know, the title of my talk suggests, there's a middle ground where we're kind of working together. I think there will be continue to be important roles for quality improvement initiatives, important roles for independent evaluations, but I think increasingly there's going to be an important role for these two uh, worlds to overlap, to be thinking hard about what we're doing, taking advantage of the opportunities that are going to present themselves. So, uh, so why is it sometimes so hard? Why is it even worth talking about evaluators and practitioners working together? Well, they come with different mindsets. It's hard to imagine that someone's being successful as a practitioner if they're pretty passionate about their work. It's hard work delivering services, whether it's health care, service for people with disabilities, any kind of social service. It's not an easy thing to do. And if you're not passionate about it, it's hard to imagine you're going to have much success. At the same time, you're not going to have much success as a researcher if you're not skeptical. And researchers are always like, well, yeah, I don't know. I've heard that before. Let me see the evidence. What do you got here? And, uh, and so these are kind of two different mindsets about how they might approach something new. And there's a third mindset, which is the mindset of the policymakers and, and uh, the evaluation funders. And it all comes to why, do they, why would they want an evaluation? Well, you have an evaluation because there's a choice. If there's no choice, there's no decision to be made, you don't need an evaluation. You just do it. You know, if there's no choice, you don't, no choice. Uh, and so when there's a choice, uh, particularly by the time choices get up to the public policy arena, uh, there's also a big constituency clamoring for action. In fact, the problems are probably pretty bad by the time we get around to actually acting on them. And they really need a solution. Uh, and so there's a big decision to be made, and the critical part for policymakers and the evaluation funders is that they need evidence that can convince skeptics. The people that are keen to do something didn't really need a lot of more information to do it. They're okay with it. They, they may have suggested they believe in it. They're passionate about it. Uh, but they're going to people who want to spend the money elsewhere. They, they're going to do something different. They think outcomes might be better some other way. And those are the skeptics. And if your information doesn't convince skeptics, you haven't really done a good evaluation. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this because we've got all sorts of initiatives, all sorts of things going on as research. Will it be able to convince anybody who's skeptical about something? And I think too often the answer is no, and that's where I think we need to be doing a better job. Um, Uh, the two worlds that I talked about, the independent evaluation world and the QI world, often kind of differ a little bit. You have the demonstrations, so these often generate very rigorous information. So we've done big demos on care coordination, uh, you know, home health care. I mean, you can look back at the history of the last 20 years, at, maybe 40 years, at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You can look at other parts of the federal government, big foundations. They've got a lot of big demonstrations, had rigorous evaluations, test hypotheses. But it tends to be a slow process. It can also take eight years to put a, a demonstration together, to wait for the outcomes to actually occur, to write it up, do the analysis, and get it uh, published and put it out. So that's eight years. Uh, and I'll get later. Uh, there was a big push in Congress a couple years when CMS was getting their budget approved. And uh, they said, you know, these big demonstrations take too long to come up with the wrong answer. Now, since it's Congress, you can say, well, I don't know exactly what they meant by the wrong answer, but let me give it this interpretation, which is that the wrong answer was that you spend eight years, and those of you who know Peter Rossi's work, there's Rossi's Iron Law, that if you do a really good evaluation of something, you're more likely to find it's not going to work. And the better the evaluation, the more likely you're going to find it not to work. Uh, and, uh, you know, so who wants to you know, put eight years into something? It was an important issue to start with. That's what got it launched. And then the researcher comes back and says, well, it didn't work. And they go, well, you're pulling your hair out. I've got to be able to work more quickly. And that's where the QI initiatives, quality improvement initiatives, come in. These work fast. And I'm going to talk off and on today about a, a program called Partnership for Patients, uh, which is trying to uh, reduce avoidable hospital-acquired conditions. Um, and uh, you know, this is not a demonstration. This is like the anti-demonstration, at least from an research, independent researcher's perspective. Uh, they're going to spend a billion dollars on it. Uh, they have uh, enlisted almost you know, all the hospitals in the country. The, the hospitals that are participating treat 80% of the admissions in this country. Uh, so they've got like everybody already involved in, in, in the whole part of it. And I'll, I'll come back to it. But it's clearly a QI effort. Uh, so it's fast. They've implemented it. They've put on a big scale. It's no limited demonstration. This is, they're really doing this big time. And so the question is, you know, will this QI effort, it went fast, 
Uh, that was good. It was national scale. That was good. But will it prevents, prevent, provide evidence that will convince skeptics, particularly the budget analysts at uh, OMB? Um, whereas the demonstrations would have probably gone much more slowly, been more limited in scope, uh, had really more rigorous convincing evidence, but would it have been enough, would it really told us what we wanted to know? And this is the tension. So I'm going to go through and t come back to this tension, how we can kind of help move it forward as researchers and practitioners. But I want to start with three stories that kind of tell us why I think random assignment evaluations are so important. Uh, and think about that as a foundation for going forward. And the first story takes place on airfields in World War II. Uh, the Royal Air Force brought a statistician out and said, here we have a, you know, a, a lot, a, a, a runway of uh, bombers that have a bunch of bullet holes in them. We want you to analyze the pattern of bullet holes and tell us where to put armor. We can't put armor all over the plane. The plane would be too heavy to fly or we wouldn't be able to take any bombs in it. Uh, so tell us where there are a lot of holes and we'll put armor there. And so the statistician looked at it for probably about five minutes and said, well, put holes or put, put armor where you don't see any holes because holes here didn't prevent the planes from getting back. Uh, and I really like this story partly because it makes the researchers sound like really cool and insightful. Uh, uh, but it, it's also important to be thinking about that you really have to think about what your goals were. Is your goal to prevent damage from bullets or is your goal to get the plane back and the crew back? Uh, and a lot of times policymakers will have what sounds like a perfectly reasonable research question, you know, tell me the pattern of holes on these planes, but it's not really the question they ought to be asking. And this is one way I think collaborations between researchers and practitioners are going to be important. People who think, the researcher community who thinks about logic models, how all this might be linked together, are, are naturally inclined to help people, well, let's think what you really want to achieve and help people frame the question well from the start. The second lesson from this one, which I'll come back to over time, is that there are statistical problems and there are sampling problems. And you know, you're always, you can describe what you observe pretty easily, but you have to think very hard about how you acquired those observations. Uh, in this case, the planes, these are the planes that made it back. The planes that got shot down, you don't observe those, at least don't observe where the bullet holes are in them. Um, so that's the first lesson. Coming back, building on that, oh, I actually had, um, Um, I want to talk about the uh, Structured Training and Employment Services Demonstration. This is a program run by the Department of Labor a while back that tried to help people with young adults with uh, intellectual disabilities get jobs. Uh, kind of a somewhat extension, the Department of Labor had tried to target people who were receiving welfare, people who'd lost their jobs from a variety of other reasons, and they at one point got to thinking, well, what about people with intellectual disabilities? Uh, but I'd like to kind of give this one a subtitle. Uh, which is, this is a nice cautionary tale for people who study program operations and the lessons of how you can easily get yourself uh, mixed up in doing something that seems, again, perfectly rational, really good, and come up with the wrong answer. So uh, some colleagues of mine were doing the impact evaluation. We were trying to answer the question, did this intervention make a difference? Uh, and could that difference be attributed to the, you know, whatever they put together, this intervention, this, the STETS intervention? Uh, there's another organization, really good set of people who were studying the operations. Because, of course, if we found it worked, then DOL said, well, we have to know what it was. Uh, and so that's what the, their job was to figure out what it was. Well, before we announced what the impact estimates were, we asked uh, the operational people, the, the, the implementation analysts, will you tell us, you rank the, the sites. There were five sites. You rank the sites. So uh, there were five sites. I've just put them by colors here. It doesn't really matter who they were. And they ranked them. So they said, this is our order. And we said, okay, well, you know, you want to know what the impact ranking was. Well, it's exactly opposite. Uh, and like, how could this happen? You know, how could they be so far off? These are really talented people. They'd seen a lot of operations. How could they be, you know, exactly wrong in their conclusions? And it largely comes because it's extremely hard to look at the counterfactual. What would have happened if the intervention that you're delivering didn't happen? In this case, the site that had the highest placement rates, most of these things was a Department of Labor program. They were interested in people get jobs, they get on jobs, they you know, sustain their employment effort. Uh, so the site that had the highest uh, job placement rates, uh, you know, was, there's a lot of action going on. You, you'd visit the site, you'd see people getting jobs. You, it, was, it was just it was a lot of activity. Uh, but when you look at the control group, because we had random assignment to evaluate, evaluate this, we'd taken the, the people who wanted to get in, half got into the treatment group, got all the services, the other half got whatever was out there in the community. They weren't restricted in any way, but they weren't given this extra service. Um, and it turned out that the people in this high-performing site uh, that weren't in the program, they all got jobs too. 
uh, not all, but the same pr fraction got jobs. And so in fact, what this site was really doing was just cleverly, I mean, not cleverly, but they were recruiting a set of people who were going to be able to get jobs anyway. And the net impact of what they were delivering was essentially zero. Uh, and at least, you know, maybe there's a speeding up, but essentially it worked out to be zero. At the low end, the site, they thought, oh, those guys don't know anything. They're never doing anything. They hardly get anybody jobs. It's the one time I can, I remember, I don't remember any other time looking at a control group and not one person in that control group had a job. And so everybody you saw in this program who got a job was a net impact. They had really taken some people who were very hard to serve, worked very hard. They failed on most of their uh, participants, uh, but they managed to get some of them jobs. And those people would not have gotten jobs otherwise. And so they had actually a very large impact. So, you know, the lessons from this is, again, the counterfactual, being able to understand what happens if you weren't there, what, you, you know, what would have happened if you you know, uh, what you observe is easy. You observed it. It's this other stuff that's so hard and makes the essence of research. And sampling comes up again. Each site here was kind of free to kind of recruit their own set of people to serve. And they chose differently. They had different kind of recruitment processes. And that led to very different impacts uh, for the sites. And so again, this need to keep both sampling, you know, how you got what you observe, and the statistics both in mind. Which takes me to the third story, which kind of just, uh, you know, it's a theme here. Uh, this is the Transitional Employment Training Demonstration. This was funded by the Social Security Administration. Again, this is about young adults with intellectual disabilities um, in testing support and employment initiatives for these folks. And uh, Social Security really wanted to know is could they do this? Could they help people who are getting SSI benefits uh, get into the labor force, earn enough money that they could then be financially independent? They didn't need the benefits any longer. And their thinking was, if that was the case, then they could afford to pay for the program because the savings would offset uh, the program costs. One wishes they thought more about whether people were going to be included in the community, what their lives were like, uh, but that was not exactly what they were thinking of. Um, we selected, I think, uh, seven sites uh, for this demonstration. Uh, and nice thing about working with Social Security data is that we were able to find basically everybody who was in the eligible population. Using administrative data, we knew the catchment area for each one of the sites. We could identify everybody who was getting SSI who was between, I don't remember exactly, I think it was 18 and 40 years old. Uh, and had a diagnosis of intellectual disabilities. Uh, so we knew who was eligible, and we sent these lists to the sites. We also sent letters out to the people uh, and tried to encourage them to come on in, uh, try to get a job. Uh, people came in, were randomly assigned to either get what was already out there or to get these enhanced services. Uh, and then we used administrative data to track earnings uh, and benefits. So let's just see what we found. So this is a chart. Uh, the vertical axis is average monthly earnings, and the uh, horizontal is time. Uh, negative 12 to 0 is the year before uh, we randomly signed them, before they came into the program. And then the next seven, two months or the six years, we filed them up. So here's the control group, not much, or the treatment group, not much happening here. And here's the control group. So two things. These groups are not identical. That's not what random assignment does. It doesn't make identical groups. It makes groups that are statistically the same on an average with a known degree of precision. And it's the known degree of precision that's really important to remember. Random assignment doesn't solve everything. It doesn't make things equal. It lets you know what you know. Uh, if you say so this is significant at the 95% level, then you know there's only 5% chance that this was really attributable to some random thing that came along, something other than the intervention you're studying. So we don't see much difference there. So that's what happened after we enrolled them. Well, the treatment group had earnings shoot up. So this is great. We were really, you know, everybody's pretty excited about this. Uh, and those earnings uh, persisted, the higher earnings, uh, for mostly the six years. There's a little decline here at the end, which I'll come back to what I think is driving that. Uh, but so this made everybody feel pretty good. But then remember the stats. Okay, well, what was going on with the control group? Is this going to, you know, you know, well, the control group had a very similar pattern, but there's two things I want to call your attention to. And the first one is the control group, you know, if you thought of it as an interrupted time series, there's a kink right at the zero. And why would that be? These guys didn't get any special intervention. And the key is, again, comes back to selection. We didn't select people at some random point in their life and say, oh, you should be in an employment program. We recruited people who wanted to be in an employment program, who wanted a job. And uh, you know, one lesson from this, uh, I may be repeating myself maybe on a later slide, but is don't bet against volunteers. You know, don't think that pre-post is going to be a good design if you took volunteers into your program. Because the volunteers, they don't get in your program. They may, as these guys did, uh, find other ways to achieve the outcome they were interested in achieving. Um, let me just click back, check my notes, see if there's anything else. Uh, uh, 
Oh, yeah, right. Um, the other thing to remember about this chart is if you look over at the uh, vertical axis, they're not earning very much money. Uh, even at the peak here, it's 180 bucks a month. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a big difference here. It was statistically significant. At the, at the, you know, it's 99%. It's there's only 1% chance that this difference you saw happened uh, through something random other than uh, the intervention that we're testing. So you're really sure that we produced this difference. And I think the people found themselves to be pretty happy. They, they liked the jobs. They liked being out in the community more. Uh, but they didn't earn enough to go off the rolls. This is not a lot of earnings. So if you're really going to like this program, again, it comes back to where I started, you're going to have to like this program because you really help the people, you help them integrate into the community. This is not going to save Social Security enough money to pay for the program. It does tell you the net costs uh, are lower than the gross costs. You did save something, uh, but not enough to pay for the whole program. So this little line shows what happened in earnings for the eligible non-participants. These are the people who are in the site who didn't uh, step forward and volunteer. So right away, you can see in the year prior to the, when the demonstration rolled out, they're really different from the people who volunteered. Um, and then we see what happened over time. Uh, not much happened with this group. A slight increase in earnings, slight decline, but really not much going on. But this tells you again, like this would be a pretty common way to do an evaluation. Let's take, uh, you know, the people who volunteered for the program, the top line, the treatment line, and let's compare the people who didn't volunteer and didn't come in. Well, you would have been really off. You know, you would have overestimated impacts by 100% if you'd just done pre-post on the treatment group, and you'd be off even more uh, if you tried to use the eligible non-participants as your reference group. So these are a lot of cautionary tales to keep in mind as we go thinking about what are you going to do if you don't have random assignment, if you don't have a way of developing a really rigorous control group. The evaluator's job is to be thinking about all these other groups, what would have happened, and trying to adjust your findings to think about, okay, well, how much is due to the really program I'm looking at, and how much is due to something else. And I think these are just the conclusions I've already talked to you about. Um, oh, the environment. Uh, over this six years that we followed people, the economy really turned down in about year five. And I think what we saw in the trend, I'll just go back here, is that uh, as the economy turned down, employment rates in both the treatment group, the control group, and actually even these eligible non-participants all declined somewhat, which is a reminder of how much the environment can take place. I remember around 2000, uh, there was a this is Verizon, one of the big telecommunication companies, uh, came to the Maryland VR agency and said, we just need staff. We, we just send us anybody you got. We, we need people. We'll train them. I don't care what their, their, their impairments are. We, you know, we, we, just, we need staff. You know, because the labor market was so hot, they were just it was finding it impossible to get enough people to do uh, what they needed to get done. And I thought to myself at the time, this is a pretty effective uh, you know, disability strategy. You get a really hot economy, and all of a sudden people will be looking to employ a wider selection of folks. Uh, you won't have to be out there trying to sell people's skills. Uh, but then as the economy turned down, which certainly happened you know, a few years later, uh, they were not knocking on the door of the VR agency any longer. So having said all this, and being from Mathematica, a company that's made its living for 40-some years trying to do large-scale demonstration evaluations, often involving random assignment, uh, that's really the best way to go. Uh, but it isn't always the best way to go. It provides a very powerful answer. As I said, it particularly tells you what you know. You can, as I said, can attribute the difference, the observed difference between your treatment control groups to the intervention with a known degree of statistical precision. You know, that's really what the difference is. Otherwise, you're kind of winging it. Uh, and you might feel good about it, and you might think, that I think these methods are robust. You might try a bunch of methods, but you don't have the same level of confidence. And again, then, is that enough to convince a skeptic? Well, it depends on the nature of the skeptic and the nature of the question. There's also the nature of internal and external validity. What I just described is very high internal validity, and, de and these demonstrations, random assignment, are really good at that. But that doesn't mean that you know very much about what happened if you replicated it. Even if you replicate it for these same people, you know, the next, you know, seven years. If you took a different set of people, different set of sites, how would any of this stuff change? Would you get the same result? Now, normally in this kind of world of demonstrations, well, your answer is, let's do another demonstration. Well, this took eight years to do this one. So another one, now you're 16 years down the road. Well, that's only two. Is that really enough to convince me that if I replicate it on a national level? Well, let's do a third really big one. Well, this maybe takes 10 years to do the really big one. So now you're like, you know, you're, you're 17, 18, you know, 20 years down the road, and people still need jobs, and you're still you're not sure you've optimized the system. Uh, you know, because you're not, you know, what, what the evaluation did was a really good job 
of answering the specific question, did this intervention make a difference, but not such a good job on the broader question. Um, so, and again, this is where the Congress came in and said these things take too long to come up with the wrong answer. So we get a whole push based out of the tradition of quality improvement systems change. And you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with this, the PDSA cycles, Plan, Do, Study, Act. Uh, when it's done right, the planning is, uh, and you know, all of this stuff, if I don't say this enough, um, I probably will say it enough. Uh, planning, everything has to start with planning. And planning late in the game uh, is not a substitute for planning at the beginning. Uh, so you plan, what do I want to achieve? Again, think back to the bomber example. You know, what am I really trying to do? 30-day uh, rehospital admission rates are a nice, convenient measure. I want to decline, have those go down. But is that really what I'm trying to do is just get readmission rates down? I could just refuse them, lock the door after they left. I mean, that would get the rates down. Uh, but that wouldn't really be achieving what I wanted to achieve. And so again, it's really important in planning to think about what are you really trying to achieve? What are your ultimate goals? Then this thing is to, in quality improvement is to do something, try to do something different, uh, study it. The study here is usually not random assignment. Usually it's saying, well, okay, um, I want to achieve, change some sort of outcome measure and I want to do it this way. So did I actually do what I said I was going to do and did the measure that I wanted to change really change? If that is, you feel pretty good about it and then you act. A lot of times you start really small uh, and uh, when they were developing penicillin, the first trial was on three mice. Uh, the next one was on a dozen mice. Uh, and it starts growing. I mean, they didn't, they, they didn't do random assignment on that stuff. Uh, I mean, later on, vaccines have been through a lot of trials. But early on, it was, it was this cycle that produced that stuff. And so you just keep expanding it and, and you know, and going through the cycles, uh, each time being very careful about what you're precisely defining, what you were trying to accomplish, doing it, studying it, and then acting. There's an article came out really uh, fairly recently. Um, uh, by J.E. Reed. This is in the British Medical Journal uh, earlier this year. And they have a nice way of thinking about the PDSA cycle that I think is useful to look at. So again, the goal, start with what you want to accomplish. Write down what you think the contributing factors are. This is not your intervention. This is not the training you're going to provide or the new format or the checklist you're going to roll out. This is what do you think really shapes those goals. Some of this is going to be directly under your control. Some of this will not be under your control or the control of the people delivering the services. And then once you have kind of thought about this, then think about what's your intervention going to be. And so think very carefully about this is what I'm going to do and it's going to change these kinds of contributing factors and maybe only some of the contributing factors, not all of them. And then those factors, the change in those factors will, will, will produce, you know, change what I'm hoping to affect, my ultimate goal, in the way I'm going to be measuring the goals. They also emphasize if you're doing all this, spend a lot of time thinking about what the environment is and then measure everything. Uh, there's a big temptation, let's just measure the outcome and if the outcome gets better, we'll be happy. But you really need to know, well, did I in fact deliver the intervention? Uh, did I you know, change those contributing factors and then did I change the outcomes I want to, to, to change? And this is, a, this is not how Partnership for Patients actually worked out. Uh, that uh, the planning part of it was uh, much too late really to get, I think, the full value out of what they're doing. But it is kind of drawing on this PDSA kind of approach. Now, Partnership for Patients, uh, I think uh, UTMB is part of this. As I said, they've in included most of the hospitals in the country trying to reduce uh, avoidable hospital acquired conditions. They're hacks. I always have to remember, what does hack stand for? You're sure you want to have hacks go down. It doesn't sound like something you want to increase. Uh, and uh, they're hoping that they, the overall that these uh, hospital acquired conditions would go down 40 percent and that uh, the 30-day hospital, all-cause hospital readmission rate would go down 20 percent. So these are big goals because they're not talking about doing this for a handful of hospitals. They want to do this nationwide. So they've taken a really big goal uh, and a big ambitious goal. And uh, before I go any further, let me remind you that I am not speaking, particularly for the people on TV here, that I am not speaking for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, they are perfectly capable of speaking for themselves and really want to speak for themselves. So I'm not uh, trying to represent anything from, uh, from their perspective. And I'm not even really speaking from the perspective of the evaluation. Uh, Mathematica team is a key part of the evaluation. But I really want to just use this as an example of an approach to policy development, an approach to research, not so much about the specific results. Although I'll, I'll talk about a few of the published results, but this is still underway. So Partnership for Patients, as I said, national in scope. It's collaborative. The idea is that we already know a lot about how you reduce 
uh, hospital acquired conditions. Uh, the work of Don Berwick, uh, Peter Pronovos, lots of people have contributed to understanding this kind of stuff. So it's not like we're approaching this and we have to do some test to, to get basic knowledge. We know a lot about this. The trick is how do you get it adopted? How do you get it adapted for all the places? So let's get everybody together. Let's track what's going on over time. We're not tracking treatment and control groups. We're just tracking the whole thing, what's going on. Uh, and this whole intervention is just keeps changing. Every month it's changing. Uh, hospitals sh share ideas. Hey, we tried this. It worked really well. Oh, let's try this somewhere else. It didn't work so well. Let's go. I mean, it's this whole learning collaborative kind of approach, uh, which of course, again, from an experimental view is like, the, this is the worst thing, right? How can you, what am I even testing? Because what it was in the first month of the program is not what it is after two years in the program. And so what is it you're testing? Well, it changed all the time. Um, so that's what this is. So how do you evaluate something like this? Well, they're trying to use, um, these are, this is a statistical control chart. Walter Sherhart and some folks at Bell Labs, the people who kind of came up with the PDSA idea, came up with these ideas, these charts as well. These things started with thinking about manufacturing processes. And so if you're manufacturing light bulbs, telephones, uh, you know, Bell Labs is working with Western Electric. Uh, there's going to be some natural variation, the quality of the minerals that went into some uh, chip, whatever. You know, and, but there's also systematic variation. And as a, someone who's worried about quality improvement, you want to get rid of the systematic variation, particularly anything that's bad. And so these statistical control charts were developed as a way of tracking what happened over time. And so the vertical axis here is the 30-day readmission rate. There's one of these charts for all of the 11 major measures they're, they're tracking. And then the horizontal is the time frame. And the first panel here on the left is the first two years. This is before Partnership for Patients rolled out. And what we see is in the hospitals uh, across the country, the 30-day readmission rate bounces around a lot, but it tends to stay within these bounds. And these are the statistical controls, so to speak. Uh, is there a tri slight trend in that uh, two years before PFP started? Eh, maybe, but it would be hard to say. They're mostly within those bounds. We then have this middle panel where you see there's a slight, maybe downward trend in the, in the pattern. Uh, this is when Partnership for Patients has been announced, but nothing really has rolled out yet. And the period covered by the last panel, the last two years, is what happened with readmission rates once Partnership for Patients really had all the hospital networks working, really had all this information sharing, this learning collaborative business going full-fledged. And well, yeah, the remission rates, not only did they fall, there's clearly a downward trend now, but they're completely outside of the bounds that contained all of the observations uh, early on. And so in the world of statistical control theory, you know, this is a real change. This is something that really went on. Uh, and, you know, CMS has done this for a lot of things. There are five outcome measures uh, in the left side, and there are, they're not always identical, but they're similar patterns to the one I just showed you where you can say, yeah, there's really a trend, things got better. And then there are six other areas where, well, it stayed mostly within the bounds that we saw, maybe it bumped up a little bit, maybe bumped down a little bit, but mostly stayed within those initial bounds. So there's really no evidence that anything changed. There's nothing that went really the wrong way, where it, it, the, the trend line went above the, the, the band we'd seen before. So you look at the whole thing and say, yeah, I mean, this is great stuff. I mean, I think partnership patients probably worked. And that's probably right, but I don't really know how much it contributed because at the same time we're doing all this, what else is going on in the environment? Well, Medicare, thinking of 30-day remission rates, started paying, or at least said they were going to start paying on what your 30-day remission rate was. Well, that'll get your attention. You know, forget partnership for patients and all this learning stuff. You know, we're going to, you know, your wallet is going to be affected. Lots of hospital systems were already doing something about this stuff. You talk to the people in Intermountain, Geisinger, uh, they were all had initiatives dealing with sort of, you know, different elements of this stuff. Uh, the Joint Commission, you know, the, the quality improvement organizations, there were lots of people. We uh, interviewed the hospitals that were involved and asked them, were you, you know, did you, any of these various kind of, I think there are 14 or so of these uh, interventions in the environment going on. Did you participate in any of these things? And you can see, you know, almost all of them, well, not, you know, 70% were doing some of this stuff, and I suspect the ones that said they weren't probably, <laughs> that somebody in the organization was, was aware of this environment. So the environment is changing a lot, and that's the problem now. That's the problem that the Partnership for Patients Project faces. You have pretty compelling evidence. If you put this evidence in the newspaper and told people, yeah, look, the, the trends are all going right, people say, yeah, that, that sounds good, you know, particularly if you're a convincing storyteller, you know, yeah, oh, that's really great, we're, we're all for that. And if the Partnership for Patients project only cost 100000 bucks a year to run, you'd say, look, let's do it, you know, and you didn't have to invest very much. Uh, but it doesn't cost $100,000 a year. It costs close to $500 million a year. Uh, and that's a lot of money. 
Uh, again, I'm not speaking for CMMI, so don't quote me as that's the exact price, but it's a lot of money they're spending on it. And so now if you're thinking you want to continue it or you want to expand it, you want to get those last 20% of the hospitals in there, uh, you want to take on new conditions, you think you're going to try to take this technique and expand it to something else, and you're going to spend a lot of money on it, well, now it's, that's a different decision. Right? And now the skeptic is going to say, well, there's a lot of money at stake here, and there's a lot of other things we could do with that money. There's a lot of other pressing social needs that Congress is going to see, uh, and uh, do we want to spend it on, uh, you know, on this particular initiative? And this is where the problem comes in. Do you have enough information? Does all the, do the statistical control charts, does that produce enough information to convince skeptics? We'll see. Uh, the, uh, the actuary at CMS is now looking at the evidence that's available, uh, weighing it, thinking about is this enough. Uh, if you read the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act closely, uh, you'll see that uh, the Secretary of HHS can now change the Medicare program. They don't have to go back to Congress. If they find, if something is, is, you know, is shown that either increases the quality of care, quality of life without increasing costs, or produces the same quality of care while reducing costs, they can just make a change. They can make the change. They don't have to go back to Congress. They, can, you know, they don't have to go ask anybody's permission. They can just do it. Nice. It's a nice permission. It's a nice way to maybe make the program work faster, which I think was the idea. But the question is, what's convincing evidence? You know, how do I really know that this intervention, which is not free, produced that change? Is it really worth you know, implementing this thing? A long time ago, I looked at a program it was uh, therapeutic shoes for people with severe diabetic foot disease. And uh, it was interesting when the Congress wrote that legislation in a really interesting way. Uh, two years into the demonstration, it was a demonstration, random assignment, the whole shebang. Uh, two years in, if you proved that the therapeutic shoes were cost effective, it became law. If it didn't, if you didn't prove it after two years, you had two more years to take a look at it. And, uh, but then interestingly, at the end of four years, it became law as long as you proved it was not cost effective. So someone thought a lot about how you, you know, were going to move you know, your type 1 and type 2 errors, and I think given the nature of social science, they almost guaranteed it would become uh, policy after four years. Probably because therapeutic shoes cost about 500 bucks. People with severe diabetic foot disease, their Medicare bills tend to be $20,000 a year. So if you're going to have an intervention for 500 bucks, and you're hoping to find and detect a difference on uh, some group of people that, that's spending $20,000 a year with a very high coefficient of variation, you know, you, you need virtually the entire Medicare population to be able to answer that question precisely. Uh, so there's a lot of this stuff, you know, you know how are you going to play this out? Anyway, I think there's a way that we can, in fact, help uh, policymakers, uh, like the people who are thinking about partnership patients, do better. And I think it involves having evaluators like the people at Mathematica, like many of you, and practitioners, like many of you, not like me, uh, work together. So let me first just come back and revisit what the questions. Again, the goals, we said the question setting was really important, and you have to start with a question. Sometimes the question is, uh, is there a problem? Uh, you know, and sometimes you just have to measure stuff and say, well, do we think there's really a problem here? Uh, and then you have to, is an intervention feasible? And uh, I don't know if many of you have worked with Paul Wayman. He's one of the early pioneers in support and employment. And I used to give him a hard time because uh, he'd done a study with, uh, uh, well, there are four co-authors and three sample members. And I kept saying, like, really? <laughs> uh, but of course, it was actually really appropriate uh, because he wasn't trying to sh prove that an intervention worked. He just wanted to see you could do this. You could take people with profound intellectual disabilities and get them a job, not in a shelter workshop, a job in the real economy. Uh, and so for that, just showing you could do it for three people was actually quite uh, an accomplishment. So sometimes that's the question you want to answer. Sometimes you want to know, well, okay, is it promising? You can do this, but could you do it on a big scale? Would it make enough of a difference uh, for people? Then, okay, now you get to the, the thing that we've been talking about. Does intervention produce the desired effects? Then you want to care about, what, as I said, will, will replicating it produce the same effect, or at least the same general effect? Why did it work? Because if you're going to replicate, you kind of need to know why, so you know what's important in replication, which elements are critical for uh, replying it. And of course, Random assignment, this is all that random assignment does, right? It's not really helping you with the rest of these questions. This is where the QI, other initiatives uh, come in. Uh, random assignment is probably unparalleled in its ability to answer this question, but it's only one of the questions that policymakers uh, come up. And also thinking about how you to figure out how you want to approach a research question, an evaluation, you have to think again, what's the nature of the choice, the decision that has to be made? So as I said, what stage of development? Are you just figuring out there's a problem? 
I mean, for a long time, they didn't really think well, there was much a problem with the welfare system. Uh, then Elwood and Bain did their study and said, well, okay, two-thirds of the people on welfare are there for six months. They're on for a little bit, then they go off, they get a job, they go back to life. Uh, but a third of the people there spend a long time, years, on welfare. Well, all of a sudden, there was an issue. Um, you know, when we were looking at data from the Social Security Administration, there's a tendency to think like, well, people who go on disability insurance, they never work because only half a percent of the people who are on uh, the disability insurance rolls actually leave because of a job. Uh, well, but when you really look at the data, when you put together, you, kind of say, you know, what we found is, well, 20 percent of the beneficiaries worked, well, 40 percent worked at some point, 20 percent worked enough to actually have their benefits suspended temporarily. So it turns out it's not that employment doesn't exist among this population, it's that people try and they for some reason can't, you know, maintain the efforts, even the, the, the reasonably sizable efforts that they make. And so sometimes it's just figuring out what do you, you know, is the question you're only trying to, to frame uh, where policymakers ought to focus their attention? You know, anyway, so this is really important to think about where you are in the policy development stage. Scale. The resources required, the relative cost of doing it versus not doing it. These are all things you have to decide. And the more that's at stake, the more the skeptics are going to have to be convinced. And so the more you're answering, oh, yeah, it's a big scale, a lot of resources to make the change. I mean, you know, uh, if you go on uh, Amazon right now, and uh, if you were a researcher type person, you decide to print the same page twice but separate about five seconds, maybe, maybe ten seconds, and you look really closely, in many cases you'll find that page changed in that short period of time. Uh, the one time that I saw somebody do this, uh, the top of the page said Father's Day is June 6th and the next time it said Father's Day is in one week. And these guys are all the time changing the pages. And they do big experiments. It's randomly, you know, assigned. And, and, you know, and you log on and it changes. And then they're seeing, well, who clicks through more? Uh, you know, who buys stuff? Is, is it really important that, that Father's Day is, is just on a particular date? Or is it more that it's, it's getting close? Uh, and there are probably thousands of these experiments done every day. It's usually Subway footlong hot dogs. Or so sandwiches, not hot dogs, I guess. That was all came up with in experiments. You know, they lose money on the uh, footlong sandwich, but they make it up on the drinks and the other stuff people buy when they come in to buy the footlong sandwich. Uh, well, how'd you know that? Well, they ran experiments. I don't know if they had the you know eight and a half inch sandwich or uh, you know all the variants, but you know they had a lot of data on sales. They could tweak different things. They, you know, even the font in the ads gets tweaked and which is going to make the most uh, difference. So there's a ton of experimentation going on. But most of these things are really simple little decisions. And if you want to change the wording or the layout of a web page, and you can see this in the, in the health uh, insurance exchanges under the Affordable Care Act, you know, where do people have to go to the help page? If they're on the help page, where do they drop out? Where do they quit? Well, you can change, you know, you can't change the law. You have to keep the, collecting the same information. But you can change the font. You can change how it's presented. You can change the sequence in which they go through the page. And you can keep experimenting with this stuff. These are all simple things to change. And there's simple things to undo. If you decide that didn't make it better, you can always go back to the other one because it's easy. So it's really when you need this convince the skeptics is when things are really hard. You know, when, when changing, going back is going to be difficult. Take a lot of resources. And the relative cost of not acting is another thing to keep in mind. And this is what I think, you know, and again, I'm not speaking for the CMMI people, but why did they roll out Partnership for Patients as a quality improvement initiative? Why didn't they try the demo way? Well, what is it, 90,000 people die every year from hospital-acquired conditions? There are millions of people get sick from being in the hospital, not from what brought them to the hospital, but they got sick in the hospital. This is a real problem. It's a problem today. Uh, it's been a problem, you know, for recently. They didn't want to wait around. You know, they really wanted to get going on this problem right away. They wanted to respond to Congress, not, not take too long to get the wrong answer. And so they thought the relative cost of waiting to get the answer exactly right or better, uh, you know, the, the waiting, the cost was too high. They wanted to jump in. Uh, and so again, all these things are changing. And so as researchers, we're going to advise them and, 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 and think about, okay, if you're going to take that course of action, let's think about what's the best way to proceed. Uh, so again, as I started, if all this change is happening, we want to learn from it. We want to get better at what we're doing. We want to know whether it's going well. So what can we do? Well, there's some things that can help speed up the process. Um, I put quotation marks around emerging methods because these are not so new, maybe newly popular. Um, one thing I've seen gotten a lot of uh, press is you can uh, do a phased rollout. So you're going to roll out the program anyway. You don't think you can run it national right out of the block. So let's randomly assign people and we'll get this group in, maybe run it for a year for them, then we'll bring the next group in. Or you know, The length of time you have between each phase could be variable. Uh, how many 
steps you have in this process is variable. But it's a way of kind of rolling it out. You're going to roll it out nationally, but you now have these little segments of time when, you know, some people got the intervention, other people didn't. Uh, some people have gotten a lot of the intervention, and some people have gotten a little bit of the intervention. You can exploit that as researchers to kind of think a little bit about what the effect was. And if you do this randomized, uh, you can actually be pretty strong. Of course, this doesn't work all the time. Um, that uh, there's a social security program ticket to work and they were going to do this. They're going to roll it out in three phases across the country. Well, first thing they did is the first phase, we really want this to work, so we're going to pick the states to roll it out. We're going to pick the states where it's going to work best. Well, okay, guess what? They were really good at picking the states where it's going to work best. And so you looked at the people there and their trajectories, their employment trajectories were different than beneficiaries elsewhere in the country. And so now we're trying to say, yeah, I mean, now we're trying to, to tease out how much is just because you're in a state that supported employment better, that had better opportunities, who know what it, knew what it was. Uh, but it wasn't clear there was a ticket to work in that case. Uh, the second thing they made a mistake on was how long. They, they had one year span. So they, the first year you roll out in a third of the country, the next year, you know, third and third year, the last part of the country. Well, this is a new program, and they had to get all sorts of service providers uh, you know, lined up. They had to get a new payment system lined up. They had to get data systems lined up. You know, because Social Security never thought their beneficiaries went back to work, they never really bothered to measure it very well. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we had was, figure, oh, we have to measure whether people went back to work, uh, which you would have thought would have been a no-brainer. I mean, but it was because it wasn't, you know, operationally important thing to measure. They didn't bother to measure it. So it took a long time. So by the time you start rolling the second cohort of people, the first cohort has barely gotten any intervention. So again, you're not going to find anything. It's just going to be the intervention is, is, you know, is going to produce too small an effect to find. But this, there are cases where the intervention will happen more quickly uh, and where you can get it implemented more quickly, where this is a, probably a way to speed up the process. There's a lot of talk recently about Bayesian methods. Um, and uh, the people at CMS have been really excited about this. Uh, they complained about what they called the tyranny of the T statistic, which I think is mostly a kind of poor way, a, a shorthand way of interpreting random assignment or you know, statistical results. You do the test, you say, okay, did this intervention produce this impact at a certain level of con statistical confidence? And the answer sometimes is no, that it didn't pass the 95% uh, level test, or 99, whatever you set the level at. And the easy thing to say, oh, it didn't work. And that's often what CMS finds, that they do something, uh, you evaluate it, it didn't, you know, it just, you know, it, it made a difference, but not a big enough difference to prove to be statistically significant. And then people think, well, it didn't work. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this because it's, it's not really what you found. Uh, you know, that particular hypothesis was, you know, when you tested it, you didn't say you could confirm my hypothesis. But it doesn't necessarily mean the program didn't work at some level for some people. But what Bayesian methods does is basically, turns the question around a little bit and says, what's the probability that an intervention will have an impact of a given size? What's the chance I reduced 30-day readmission rates by five points? Uh, and that, maybe the number is 95% if it's really lucky, but maybe it's 70%. Well, if it's 70%, the statistical interpretation is going to say, well, that just didn't work. But a policymaker might think 70% chance of it winning, that's great. My usual odds are like 2%. Uh, it reframes the research question in a way that policymakers are more comfortable thinking about it. And this is actually coming back to the random assignment stuff. The real beauty of this is it's really simple. It doesn't require a lot of statistical work. If you really are successful, it's not easy, but if you're successful at randomizing a group of people coming into the program, getting half the treatment, or whatever the fraction is, the treatment and the other, the control group, following them over time, following them accurately over time so you don't have a bias where you're following all the treatment group really carefully and the control group not so carefully. But if you do all that, then you just have to compare means. There isn't any fancy statistics. Uh, you can sometimes get a little extra power by trying to do some statistical work, but you really don't have to. And it's very simple to explain to somebody, I did the treatment group, I did the control group, here's the difference. Oh, they get it. If you went and said, you know, as an econometrist, here's my big econometrician model I ran, and uh, you, know, you have four pages of equations, not one of which they can understand. They look at you like, eh, I don't know. I mean, first of all, they can't figure out exactly what you did. And there's always this nagging suspicion. There's just some assumption buried in all those equations that they don't really understand whether that assumption is valid, whether they believe going forward that would be a good, uh, and you may not really know either as a researcher. Um, so why did I get up on that tangent? I don't know. Anyway, uh, 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 it's tricky to evaluate uh, um, 
to interpret, you have to be careful. Even if you've done random assignment, you have to be careful you've interpreted accurately. Orthogonal designs, you might be looking at, say, a care management program, and there might be a dozen ways in which you train people. Looking at hospital discharge, is a phone follow-up within three days enough? Is it a phone follow-up that afternoon you got to do? Do you need in-person follow-up? Does the person doing the follow-up need to be an RN? Can it be just a, you know, a social worker? What do, you, what do you really need? You might be thinking, like, there's, there's 20 different things I'd like to test in this program. Well, orthogonal designs offer you a way to go about doing that without actually having to do however huge number it would be of each possible combination of those 20 different things. Uh, you can field off in 7 to 10, 12 uh, options that have different combinations of these factors and then by adding and subtracting the impacts from each one of those uh, you can then determine uh, a lot about how these component pieces worked out. In particular you can try to decide if two things produced the same outcome and one was less expensive or easier to implement or produced better outcomes for the patient other than cost. And the last one is these rapid, rigorous experiments. This is the kind of thing that Amazon is doing. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which you can take operations and you just, just tweak some element of the operation for a little bit, randomly assign people. It usually only works if the data is already being collected. That's nice about Amazon. They have a ton of data, uh, probably even more data than we can imagine. Um, uh, and they have a huge flow of people on their website. So you get a lot of observations, you get a lot of data on it really quickly. When you have that kind of situation, these rapid cycle uh, is like the footlong uh, subway sandwiches. Um, so these are all ways in which uh, I think you can kind of speed up the process a little bit. I think we can also spend a little bit more time when you don't do random assignment, you're going to have a quality improvement initiative that we can make these more rigorous. And this is a place where I think partnership for patients fell down a little bit. They were really anxious to get going. Was, I mean, they were motivated. You knew at the very beginning of this project that it was going to be different. You know, I've been to a lot of you know, evaluation kickoff meetings. They're kind of dry. You're going, think, okay, what is the outcome measure? What's this? And you're sitting around trying to, you know, what's the schedule? All this kind of stuff like this. Partnership patients started, they get everybody, it's a big crew in the room, they turn off all the lights and a spotlight comes on uh, and there's one guy there. And he's telling the story about how his wife died from a medical error. And like everybody's like, oh my God, this is terrible. And the, the people that got up, they, they, they're talking about how passionate they were about making change. Now, this is not going to be, you know, your standard uh, independent evaluator uh, uh, study. Um, so there are going to be cases where people really want to move forward. They just, you know, they're compelled to move forward. They don't want to wait for the usual things. And in fact, as they did in partnership patients, they already know a lot, thanks to Don Berwick, Peter Pombos, the other ones, other people. We know a lot about how to get care better. So they already knew a lot. They thought, let's just try to go out and make this happen. This is going to happen, I think, more and more. There's a program called Money Follows the Person that's trying to help people who are in nursing homes get out and live in the community. Uh, CMMS is also pushing that when they spent, I think, $4 billion on that one. Uh, and 43, 45 states are participating. So it's not a demo, right? The states that didn't participate have got to be really weird. If you're with a state that didn't sign up, uh, you know, you're different for whatever reason. And uh, it's going to be hard for evaluators to kind of control uh, whatever that difference would be for. But I think you can make these QI efforts, which are going to come more and more in public policy, I think, because people are going to want to move forward. Uh, a small scale and a big scale. So the first thing is know the goals. It's come back to that uh, action effect method. Uh, it's knowing the goals, knowing who you want to convince, how big a decision is this going to be. It's specifying the logic models at the start. Now, does it help you as a researcher think about, okay, how am I going to collect data? How am I going to analyze it? What's my final report going to look like? Uh, but it also, I think, will help the program the practitioners think like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. It's like these guys with the airplanes and the bullet holes. Oh, yeah, we need to be thinking about where the plane is vulnerable, you know, in, in, where there weren't any bullet holes. Tracking implementation, this is really important. It's important to do it from the get-go, from the beginning, not waiting for them to implement everything, get it all running, and then come and think like, okay, uh, now let's go back and figure what you did. Because if, you, if you're asking people now what they did three years ago and something that's dynamically changing like partnership patients, well, no one wants to say, oh, yeah, well, three years ago I was doing something really stupid, and now I realize that was bad. I mean, no one's ever going to admit that. It's like once congressman asked, you know, are there ever a positive unintended consequences? Plenty of negative unintended consequences of public policy. And I said, well, no, there's never any unintended positive consequences because people always take credit for it. Oh, yeah, no, we thought that was going to happen. Uh, so you never find any reported instances of, um, I think, positive things. Anyway. Having the logic model, tracking implementation, did it really, did it really get implemented as planned, uh, and tracking the outcomes before, during, uh, and after the change started. Uh, and mostly it's just being really systematic about it. Uh, it's also tracking the environment. Uh, there was a program a while back 
uh, looking at neonatal uh, care. And the program rolls out and they see a big decline in infant mortality. Well, a big decline. You know, for, our, for the U.S., a big decline. And the program was really excited. Look, we roll out our program and, uh, you know, and, and uh, mor infant mortality goes down. Well, then we started looking at the environment. It turned out a drug called surfactant had come out at the same time their program was introduced. And surfactant has an incredibly powerful effect on helping infants with uh, pulmonary problems. And it really increases the survival dramatically. So there's something going on, you know, in the environment at the same time the intervention. They didn't do random assignment, so we couldn't tell whether they actually had made a boost. You know, the control group got better and the treatment got even better. Uh, you were left without really knowing what was going on. So, but, you know, again, you have to kind of track the environment. And if all this works out, if you do all these things very systematically, uh, you can try to uh, array the information you've got, you know, particularly if you set this out in advance. If you're not making the story up ex post, ex post stories everybody's really suspicious of. Uh, it's just like why there's no positive uh, unintended consequences. Um, so if you set out, this is what we're trying to try to do, this is how we're going to measure what we're going to do, this is what we're doing, this is those contributing factors, this is how it's all going to work. Then you go and say, yeah, we really did what we said we were going to do, we really changed those contributing factors, and we saw uh, the change in outcomes happen. We don't see anything in the environment, that, uh, at least nothing dramatic that would have produced the same change. We think we're pretty confident this made a difference. That's probably as credible as you can get out of this. But, you know, when people do QI efforts, they forget most of the planning, most of the measurement. They don't think about putting all these pieces together. So I think this process can be, you know, much more likely to convince skeptics, more likely to help the actuary say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to invest some money and make this change. Uh, but you need to be credible about it. And one last way I want to talk about, since I'm here, that we can get better. Uh, is that uh, you can establish ongoing partnerships. Uh, a few years ago, Mathematica was involved in a study for CMS, and uh, there were 15 care coordination sites. And uh, it was the usual thing. It took us a year to you know, recruit all the sites and get the data systems in place. It took them, I think, two or three years to get enough sample members into it so they could really deliver the intervention. And it took a few years after that for us to observe whether people were really getting better. Uh, what was their care like? What was their lives like? Uh, and so, roughly eight years. Uh, and only two of the 15 sites did we find uh, impacts. So CMS said, oh, didn't work. Okay, that's, that's it. We'll go on to the next thing. I remember at that moment thinking, like, this is really the wrong way to do public policy because we already had a set, a partnership between evaluators and practitioners. We already put the data systems in place. People were used to filling out the data. The practitioners were used and, and wanted to make, you know, their practices better. They knew among the 15 that two of the sites seemed to have a real impact. So why not take what those two sites had done, figure out how it differed, and roll it out in the other sites, and, and keep it going. You know, why walk away from all this infrastructure that had taken years to build uh, and, uh, and think, okay, that was the end of the demonstration. Again, this is the tyranny of the T-statistic. No significant result didn't work, which is just kind of lazy thinking. Uh, and so I think there are ways which places like Mathematica, you know, can, you know, engage, and we do engage with practitioner groups, but even within places like UTMB, you know, getting the evaluators to talk to the clinicians, thinking about how do we get this together, how do we, you know, plan to learn rather than, oh, I should have planned, learning to plan, uh, which happens too often. Building the data systems, uh, tracking outcomes people care about, uh, fostering a learning collaborative, getting people to be thinking about, yeah, we can learn, we can, we can do better. Now, what does better mean? What, you know, what, do, what, what, are we, what are our goals? How can we measure those goals? Um, when you think you want to influence policy outside of an institution, uh, you want to make a difference on the national stage, it's getting the, the national policymakers involved early on so you can think and get an idea, well, what kind of evidence do I need? What, what's going to convince the skeptics? Um, and as I said, uh, well, be rigorous, learn as much as possible, but plan ahead. Uh, I think I've said that before. Uh, so anyway, um, I think it's also important, uh, one last thing about these partnerships and all these kind of alternate methods, is if you don't have random assignment, uh, you can't pretend that you did. Uh, when the actuary pushes back on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation and says, well, we really want to know what the impact of all this was, uh, they say, oh yeah, we've got impacts, and they start bringing out the statistical control charts. Well, that's not the same. We didn't, you know, it's not a random assignment. We can't go back and create what wasn't there, wasn't put built into the system. Uh, maybe there's a statistical way to go find some people who got different, you know, there's a dose response way you can approach it. Maybe some hospitals didn't do as much, but it's really hard uh, to go back in time and figure this out. Uh, 
So I think that you, you, know, you have to be careful about describing what you really know. You can't then say, well, we didn't do random assignment, we didn't really do a rigorous evaluation, but now I'm going to present my results as if I had, like I really proved this works. Uh, you can say I've got a compelling case, and you, you look at all those statistical control charts that Partnership for Patients has produced, you look at the pattern of evidence, and you say, you know, yeah, if I was a decision maker, I think this makes sense to keep going with this stuff, at least at some level of activity. Uh, and, uh, but that's not saying you had the random assignment there. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd close by think I had doctor decide to have the evaluators and the practitioners rowing furiously together, uh, really trying to move us ahead. Uh, that this is the the mission that we're we're, we're working together. Uh, it's not uh, two different groups. Uh, there will be times when we need to be our separate perspectives and they'll have a lot of value. Uh, the different roles, but there are a lot of times we want to be in the same boat moving forward because the people we're trying to help. Uh, the problems we're trying to solve are important enough that we really need to do our best. Thanks. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.